Hey, what's up? Welcome to the CEO Pulse podcast where you get the real, the raw, and the mind of entrepreneurship. Today, we are sitting down with Kevin Maney. He's an author, a columnist, and uh, um, he, is, he specializes in a very interesting topic, which is um, category creation, all right, and how to build a brand from the, from the ground up. And, and we're going to be tackling in some of those fundamentals as well. Kevin has been covering uh, tech and society for 30 years. He's a journalist, and uh, he's also the author of Play Bigger, How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for stopping by, man. I appreciate the time. Yeah, awesome to be on. I appreciate having, <laughs> having me, Rafael. <laughs> so uh, you're you're doing a, uh, I mean big things in a couple of different spaces. One is having a book out there, um, and then the other one is is I mean fundamentals of, um, of of strategy in business, which is you know new categories and and uh, you also um, talk about you know, making a narrative out of the uh, CEO story. So I think when it comes to branding and positioning, you know those are you know two of the most important things. Um, give us a little bit of background on you and. Uh, and let, let's kick it off with that. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, so I, I mean, as far as the storytelling part of this, so I, I come at this as a <clears throat> journalist. I started um, mm -hmm. for almost three decades writing about technology, mm -hmm. just about every major publication you could probably name. Um, and, wow. and, and I had a lot of experiences, you know, um, uh, I tell the story oftentimes when we're working with clients. Uh, for instance, uh, I was, I was a technology columnist for USA Today for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, Part of my role there was I mean, my job for a publication like that was to take complex things about technology and write about them in a really simple, straightforward way that anybody could grasp. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so um, I, you know, I had because I've been covering this for so long. I interviewed Jeff Bezos a number of times in the early days of Amazon. Wow. And um, and so in 2006, I mean, this this is actually kind of a a bit of a lead into like what I do now because it all kind of comes back to circles back, but. Uh, I remember in 2006, I was at a, a technology conference um, in San Francisco. I'm walking around the floor and my cell phone rings and Bezos' PR uh, um, person call, is on the phone and says, Jeff wants to talk to you up in suite, whatever it is upstairs. And uh, so I, 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 should, I feel like, of course, yeah, I'll be up there in a second. So I go up <laughs> and, and, uh, um, and I sit down with, with Bezos and and he start, this is 2006, right? So he starts explaining to me this new thing Amazon's going to do. And he calls mm -hmm. it the Elastic Compute Cloud. Um, and he starts telling me all this things and stuff about like, we're going to sell computing by the SIP and, you know, and you could use what? a credit card and all this kind of stuff. And now keep in mind, this is a time well before anybody, cloud computing wasn't in anybody's Yeah, cloud head, wasn't know, a thing back then, 2006. Thing at all. Yeah. And, um, and so he's explaining, it takes like 20 minutes to explain this thing to me. And I look at him across the table and say like, how in the world are you going to explain this to the rest of the world? And he said, that's what you're here for. <laughs> so, um, I, I, you know, I, like I, by, uh, I started to become somebody who a lot of uh, tech companies would actually like want to talk to me because I would then write about things in a way that they could then use as a way to, to more easily explain. Push it out. Doing. Yeah. Articulate it. Yeah. That, Fast forward this, like, I mean, I, I wrote, you know, a lot of things in journalism. I wrote a bunch of books. I ended up working with um, three Silicon Valley um, startup advisors to write this book that came out in 2016 called Play Bigger. And uh, Play Bigger proposed this idea of category design, of, of trying to take a, um, find a market space and, and, and design it to your own. So, so it works for you instead of um, you trying to grab market share from somebody else. We get into all that a little bit later. Um, but at the heart of category design is really trying to understand what a company's really doing, the space it's really occupying and the problem it really solved and articulate it in a really straightforward way. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, after the book came out, you know, and I thought I would just go be an author and journalist for the rest of my life. Um, the book caught on um, a bunch of a lot of CEOs and venture capital investors and such started calling us and saying, help this company do what you just wrote about in the book. And it turns out that that ability, that ability to um, really uh, cleanly articulate something that's everybody else is caught up in the complexity has really become valuable. And, uh, and now this is a big part of what I do for a living. I work mm -hmm. with companies to try to help them with this category design problem. 
and writing these narratives that um, can help them define that category and, and own it over time. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, you're, you're really uh, making a very important point here. A lot of times it's, it's harder to simplify something um, and, uh, and articulate it than, than it is to build the thing out, right? Um, okay. I think we, we're, we're wired to think um, in terms of, I mean, I, I see the thought process as a cloud, it's not linear. Usually the thought process is, you don't think about this one thing first and then this other thing, you know, step two and then step three. Usually you start getting bombarded with different ideas and it becomes this cloud, um, you know, whatever the idea is. It, it, and the details of it are, are in the head, right? So it's one right. of those things that you can, you know how to do it, you see it, you know how it's going to kind of work out. But when you try to put it out there, it, it's like it comes, it's all broken up. It's right. convoluted and there, it takes a special... Um, talent to be able to articulate things like that and make it linear make it understandable um for well, for those who don't have it you know inside their head <laughs> well and, and the other thing that you know is perfectly understandable <clears throat> is you know you take some startup and mm -hmm. um that's been go you know going at it for two years mm -hmm. and um and the founder and the the the, the you know team that's close around them um are they're they're head down looking at this thing they're trying to create and build right and, and right. all the complexity of it is is you know always milling around in their head or whatever um uh, and oftentimes they they also don't have a, a lot of time to just sort of look up and understand the broader context of where they fit in um what else is going on in the world that that affects what they're you know what they're actually building um and and so it can be really helpful to have another person sit down and draw that out and then put mm -hmm. it in the broader context because um because this the, the startup team is they have a different job to do their job mm -hmm. is to build this thing their job is not right. necessarily to tell that story i mean the really great ones the steve Jobses of the world you know kind of just intuitively do that but not yeah. everybody can and and it's understandable yeah it's it's far and few those who have the uh, the innate uh, ability to do it right to to actually come up with a vision and, and then articulate it and explain it to the world uh, i think um, more so it can become one of those learned you know learned skills um, as you practice it but if you have somebody who can come in and do it uh, at a professional level like why <laughs> you know what i mean right. yeah right. no and it's important without without that uh, piece of the puzzle i mean it doesn't matter how great the uh, the, uh, the the product is in, in this case you're sitting down with Jeff Bezos and he's shooting you like the next you know the eighth wonder of the world and and it's gonna happen the guy has been killing it I mean in an amazing astronomical way uh, since the early 2000s uh, so you're sitting down with this guy and and this is coming out right in his head it kind of makes sense but articulating it to the world is different like pushing right. the message in a clear way um, it's as important if not you know as uh, the more important if not as important as the actual product otherwise people don't know what they're you know buying into right by the way i think i skipped the punchline <laughs> of that which obviously is that what he was explaining to me was aws which then became like this you know a multi multi-billion dollar business <laughs> and spawned an entire industry so insane um, but, insane uh, aws but yeah the um uh you know the um the other thing that we really we, we emphasize, um, and so now this this whole thing has turned into a practice, a mm -hmm. firm that now I have called Category Design Advisors, and we do this for companies regularly. Mm -hmm. and, and the whole category thing is is an important linchpin, also in terms not just the storytelling, because what we what we go in and say is like, okay, well, look, um, the you know the 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 great companies essentially find a new market space and define it and and own it for themselves over a period of time. And if you look at digital markets and you name almost any kind of space, uh, usually there's one company that absolutely dominates, takes, you know, 75 percent of the revenue and, and economics out of that space. And maybe there's a number two, you know, classic like an Uber Lyft situation. Right. Right. Um, and then there's a bunch of <clears> others <throat> that, you know, that trail and just have little market shares below. And um, and so the point we're making is that if um, the way to build a great company is to, uh, is to create and define and own a, a category of your own, then why wouldn't any company want to try to do that rather than saying, mm -hmm. we're entering this other category, or oh, there's a, you know, this, we're, we're, ent we're entering a space somebody else is in, but we think we could do it better. Um, and when you make that better argument, you're really kind of like trying to just grasp for some market share out of a market that already exists. 
And what we're saying is like, let's, instead of doing that, let's look at um, a way to maybe move you slightly to the side so that you're creating something that seems new and feels new to people mm -hmm. different, not just competing against somebody else and, and, and create this new space that you can own. And, and that's, that's the way we try to get, you know, companies to think. And then the narrative actually tells a story of that space and in a way that, mm. that in a way that benefits the company that's actually creating it. So that's, that's the basic idea. So you're using the, uh, the narrative or the clarity of the, uh, of the story behind it to not only push it out to the audience or to the, to the consumers, but also to fine tune the message inside the company. That's what I'm catching, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. In fact, in fact, it's just as important for inside the company. Yeah. Uh, because, well, here's, uh, you know, what, as you, you, you probably have encountered this many, many times, right? So you have a, you have a, you have a, a company that's been around three or four years and, mm -hmm. uh, and they actually um, have had some success, right? They, they started some product, they, they've done, and they kind of get to a point where it's like, okay, well, what's next? You know, mm -hmm. we, we did, we did this thing we started with, but there, there's got to be like a, a next level to go to. So you sit down with the, and what we, the way we always do this is we want, you know, six, eight, 10 members of the leadership team around a conference room table and have this big whiteboard kind of discussion, whatever. Yeah. War and room first, style. <laughs> and the first, the first thing you find out is that if you have eight people from the team in the room by that point in time in a company's life, all eight of them have a different idea of what the company does now and what oh, it's yeah. going to do in the future. And, and so one of the really important things is just getting that alignment of everybody agreeing that this is what we are doing. This is how we talk about what we're doing. This is the vision we're going for. Mm -hmm. um, and, and part of that process is actually getting, getting that alignment because, um, you know, you, these, you know, these, these teams all, they may, they may click and work well together, but if you actually get inside of the heads of each person, they, they are saying something different and, and that's, uh, that's not good for a company. Yeah, it's, it, it, I mean, I think that's where clarity comes in, right? I mean, some people are going to be open to, to um, exploring new, uh, new frontiers mm -hmm. and within the business, within the leadership boards. And I've had that happen in, in consulting sessions with clients before. And where we come in, we sit down with, uh, with management board. And then, you know, some people are open to new strategies and some people are just not like, everything is working, wait, and, you know, great, why break it? And well, the PNL is different, uh, or <laughs> yeah, or we have to pivot because I don't know policy change, uh, and the the opportunities are opening up, up opening up in different areas. Now we have to tap into those, but not everybody's open uh, to doing that kind of stuff. Uh, that kind of stuff, especially when the uh, when the narrative uh, is not clear enough for them to understand. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. So what one of the things that um, it, it, it's an interesting too is one of the things that we start with when we sit down with a company is the question, what problem do you really solve? Mm -hmm. You And you wouldn't believe how hard that question is to answer. <laughs> most don't know. <laughs> but it actually is. Because, because what, what, what do most companies do? Most companies, if you, if you ask about them, what they tell you is what their product does. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they kind of leave it up to you to like, well, this is what the product does. Oh, well, now I have to decide what it actually is solving for me. Um, but we try to... To, st to start the conversation by reversing that and say, what, pro you know, what problem do you want to solve? What problem is out there in the world that's not getting solved um, in a, in a you know, good way today? Or maybe people don't even realize that that problem exists until you explain it to them. Um, but if you're not solving a problem that people really feel, you don't really have a product with a lot of legs. I mean, you've got something that's just a nice to have rather than a need to have. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the, you know, we'll often sit down with a client and have an entire six hour day conversation uh, just about what is the problem that you really solve. And let's, let's dig down and really get to that and who has it and how do they feel it and what do they want to have happen and just kind of get into all of that. And that, that actually can unlock the conversation about um, what the, you know, what the category is, what the narrative is. Yeah. And so you, you start tapping into this. Um, and, I mean, it, it's almost uncharted wa waters, right? People usually when they whenever they join a company, um, aside from the uh, from the founders, um, they'll they'll join a, a vision that's already existing. It hardly ever gets uh, 
redesigned once it launches uh, or, and, and unfortunately, one thing that I see often too is people, uh, founders don't usually tap into the, the, the creative power of the team that they have in place, right? To get new perspectives and that sort of thing. So um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get to is you usually start off with this one category and everybody just kind of buys into that category as opposed to creating new spaces of opportunity. So right. how, how, does, uh, how does a company or a business um, begins to develop that, uh, that new category and create something that's you know, practically out of nothing, right? Right, right. Well, I mean, it, 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 this may sound you know, almost trite, but it, all, it actually starts with just thinking that way hmm. um, and, and thinking, okay, we're, we're not gonna enter somebody else's market space let's let's uh, a, a great you know so a great category usually is either um a problem everybody knows they have and can't solve or, or they are solving badly with whatever is out there at this point mm -hmm. uh, or i can or think of a few of those yeah <laughs> a few of those. or sometimes even better is is a problem people don't yet know they have mm -hmm. until you explain it to them mm. um, I, I'll, give, I'll give you a great example of that oh that's huge um, so uh, Steve Jobs was great at this, right? And uh, um, you know, and and uh, um, so the day he gets up to um, introduce the iPad to the world, and he stands up on stage and he and he explains um, that uh, so there's this new media, digital media universe that's emerging, and this is early when all this is happening, right? We're starting to consume movies and TV shows and music and books, all on digital devices. Um, and he stands up and he shows an image on one side. He says, okay, well, you probably, you know, have this phone um, and you could do that on the phone, but it's got this little screen and it's really sucks for watching a movie and, you know, all that. Uh, or you probably have this laptop over here and, um, and that's kind of big and bulky and doesn't really balance on your lap well if you're watching on the couch. And so he, he said like, okay, so if you understand, like, this is too big, this is too small, we have this new universe of digital media that uh, is, is just starting to, you know, get into our lives, you don't have the right thing to look at this stuff on. Um, mm. and, and suddenly he's putting this idea in our heads that, oh, yeah, all right, I actually yeah, am starting to that, consume all this stuff. It does suck. This other thing doesn't work. <laughs> And then he and then he throws up an image of the iPad and he says we're and he literally said we're we're introducing a new category of computing, um, mm. and ours was called the iPad and he showed what this thing was. So he introduced into our heads this idea that there was a pro new problem we didn't even know we had. But once he explains it, you go like, oh yeah, actually, it's per it's I, yeah, I, you know, it's I clear to see. <laughs> yeah, how can how have I been living without? And I right, right. Wow. Yeah. No, man. That's that's um. Uh, it's it's an eye opener, really. Mm -hmm. Um, tackling something. I've always looked at uh, at the problems. Right. We uh, coaching students and and everybody I come in contact with. There's there's always um, um a need for a solution. So mm -hmm. that's been the approach. That's the, the traditional approach. And okay, what can we, what's the problem that we have that we can solve? Um, but honestly, I haven't tackled anything in, in formal business um, from the perspective of, okay, what problem do they have that they don't know about? Yep, right. And that's a huge, huge question. And, and, and look, you know, um, tablet computers that had existed for a decade before mm -hmm. um, the iPad came out and Microsoft built a tablet computer that it was marketing really heavily. But basically the tablet Microsoft built was a laptop that just had a screen you could write on essentially. Mm -hmm. and, and so it, they, they never articulated that this new device solved any kind of new problem. It was just, a, it was just another version of what you already had. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and the, so tablets didn't you know, catch on as a, as a thing until Steve Jobs stood up and said and, and showed us why you'd want one. Um, and, and suddenly we got it. And, and so this is what we try to do with company after company is say, like, look, let's, you know, uh, let's find that problem. And yes, you know, it's in the context of what company you already have or the products you already build. But once we see that problem clearly, it may actually suggest that the product you, you have needs to be altered a little bit. Um, be, because what you want, I mean, what you want as a company is to um, to see a clear space and a clear market that you could actually, you know, that you could actually, um, you know, make something of. 
uh, just having a product that does something interesting is not a market. Yeah. And so if you think that way first, if you think we're going to build this cool thing and we're going to send it out there and, and hopefully it'll find a place in the world, that doesn't work. Um, but what does work is, is seeing the space first and building something that addresses that problem. And that's, you know, that's where you get great companies. Well, yeah. And the, I, mean, I think that's also where the power of story, uh, storytelling comes in. Right. I mean, bringing it all together. Uh, so for a new, uh, I do want to uh, tap into the, uh, the, the power of storytelling and bringing that into the you know, business aspect, um, because it's, it's huge. I mean, and I know I've had a challenge with that before. Uh, everything looks like, you know, rainbows and unicorn farts in my head. Um, but when I try to articulate it and put it out there, like nobody understands what I'm doing. Uh, uh -huh. For the longest time, um, people did not understand what my businesses uh, were, were like. Okay, what are you doing now? Are you doing real estate? Are you doing what? Like, well, what are you doing now? Like, now you're, you're a YouTuber? Like, you're doing, like, no, it's not that. But I, I just, I didn't have the, um, the, the know-how of how to articulate the, you know, the package uh, of, of what, I, what it is that I'm doing. And I think that's huge. So it's one of the things that kind of lands close to home because pushing that message is one thing, clarifying it is it's a completely different thing. So I want I want to tap into that, but give me a, give me a couple of things. What does a uh, a new category uh, need to have? What are some of the principles that uh, that companies need to look out for when they're creating a new ca uh, category? Um, well, there's so there's uh, um, I mean, first of all, it starts with um, that problem, and, and is it something that is not being solved now? Because if it is, if you're if you're basically saying somebody else is already you know doing that, you're you're entering somebody else's market. And you're going to scratch for some market share. The other thing to remember is that our brains think in terms of categories, especially when there's a lot of choice out there. Mm -hmm. So if you think about like, I mean, you go into a grocery store, it's not arranged alphabetically. You know, you don't go in, <laughs> you don't go in and think like, I need this thing. I'm going to go to the K aisle. Yeah, it's it's a, it's arranged by categories, and you yeah. think I, I I need condiments. I'm going to go to the condiment aisle, and then you think of the specific thing you need and the brand that comes to mind and, and you, you find it there. Um, and, and in a B2B so true. Set, and in a B2B setting, um, a category is a budget line item. Um, you know, some, somebody, mm -hmm. a, a, a company's budget doesn't say, I need this brand of something. It says, I need this thing because mm -hmm. that solves a problem for us. And, and what you want to be is you want to, you know, create that budget line item and then be the first thing that comes to mind when people say, I need to solve what that budget line item is about. Mm. Um, and so because our brains think in terms of categories first, if, if you can create the category, it opens up a new space in people's minds um, so that they understand they might need this thing. Mm. And, and then the, the, the other, um, uh, the, the secondary piece of that is that, um, uh, is that when you, um, when you establish yourself as that category leader, the one who's defined it and, and, and it really richly describes what it is, uh, it's pretty hard to get unstuck from that category leadership position. And you know, the best product doesn't always win and the best marketing or doesn't always win. It's establishing that, that sense that you um, own and created this category. Mm -hmm. you know, and, so, and so like, you know, you get situations like, look, you know, we all go to Google to search Microsoft spent like $10 billion trying to convince us that Bing was a better search engine. And it may have been, we didn't care because to, in our heads, the category of search already existed. There was already a, a category king in search. It was this Google. We just automatically go there. You don't say, you don't say, look it up in the internet. Most people no, say, Google it. Right. Yeah. Google, Google, it. It. Google it. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. There was a, there was, wow. a, you know, and, and these, this kind of thinking is, this is not new, right? This has been going on forever. You go back um, to the 1980s, uh, you know, one example I often bring up is, um, is Chrysler with the minivan. Mm. And, and so here, so here was 1980s, you just to paint a quick picture for your listeners. Um, so Chrysler's going bankrupt. Um, uh, the, the Japanese have uh, Toyotas and, and Nissans or whatever have, have been building much better cars than the American car makers. There is absolutely no way that Chrysler can go to the market and say, um, we've built a car that's better than the cars that are on the market. Nobody would have believed them. It would, and they would have maybe scratched a little market share out and they wouldn't have turned the company around. So at the time, um, talk about context. Context is always important. Mm -hmm. um, Chrysler was looking at demographics and understanding that, um, that the baby boomers are starting to move out to the suburbs and have families. 
Um, and uh, and they go out to the suburbs and you know they start having the, the second, third kid. And now the choices are um, you can buy a station wagon, which is kind of like this other you know version of a car, or maybe you could buy like a van, but that's too tall to fit in your garage. It drives like a truck, you know, it's not really great. Bulky, yeah. And and so um, Chrysler created a different a solution to that problem that was different from anything on the market. They um, they they built this thing called a minivan, um, and and interestingly, if you think about that too, is they created a category of minivan. They didn't go to market and say, "Hey, we've built this Dodge Caravan, and here here's all the features of what it does." They actually created the space in people's minds of. You have a family, you go out to the suburbs, you have that second kid, you know what, you better think about a minivan. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, we at Chrysler invented the minivan and we've got these, you know, we've been building them for a long, you know, and, and so um, when anybody thinks minivan, whatever it is, 40 years later, um, the first dealership people are going to go to a lot of times is the Chrysler dealership to look at those. And, mm -hmm. and all this time later, the company still has 50% of the global minivan market, it's really hard to unstick a category king once they get that established. Um, and it's and it's a really powerful mechanism for building a business. And it saved Chrysler in that particular case. Wow. Yeah, I hadn't, I'd never thought about that. And you, you're completely right. I mean, even to now, it doesn't matter what, what you pick up, right? You have the, the, I mean, they call it the soccer mom, you know, vehicle and whatnot, but that's one of the things that they tied it back into also, you know, back in the day, I remember. Um, it's uh, yeah okay amazing so and so and so if you're you know if you're at any kind of company like it doesn't whatever you're doing whether you're making a software for deep inside some you mm -hmm. know data center or whether you're making a consumer product or whatever something like that Chrysler story needs to play out where you mm -hmm. where you understand in the context of what's happening out there in the world that there is a a a, a new problem to be solved uh, and there's a and you can, and you as a company can create a different and new way to solve it that's that's never been solved before, which establishes this idea of there's a new category that I need to think about. You open that space in people's minds, and then you say we're the one who can fill that space, right. and that's that's the path to uh, to category creation. Yeah, I think you got to bring the awareness that they need that, right? Yep. Like right. the consumer needs it. Not, it's not. I mean, just like you said right now, what what do they don't know they need? Uh, once you plant that seed in there, it's it's kind of like watching one of those uh, horror movies, right? Um, it, it, you know, watch it. You watch a scary movie, and then after the movie's done, like you have, like you go check your doors. Like, okay, <laughs> right. you weren't you weren't afraid before the movie, but they planted it in your head that somebody may break in. Like that's now a good gonna, point. You know, check. Yeah. Out, I'm gonna go check the windows, check the doors, make sure that everything's good. Everything's perfectly fine, just like it was before the movie, but the awareness wasn't there. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So you uh, you talk about CEO storytelling and yeah. making it a narrative. I mean, that's a lot of the stuff that we're kind of bringing in conjunct uh, conjunction here. But uh, tell me about that. What what is that um, uh, structure wise? What does that look like? And what does that do for a business? Well, you know, and so but you know what you've already kind of raised and know is that narratives work, right? Mm -hmm. Just throwing a bunch of facts at people does not work. Nope. Um, and, and and humans are wired for narratives, and uh, and in fact, when we when we work, you know, say we work with a company, um, once we tease out all of that stuff about the problem, the category, how does all this work, why does it matter, all that kind of stuff, none of it happens until we put it into a narrative um, that that can then everybody can rally around, and there's a very specific way um, that uh, that we do that. Um, and it's the plot of every superhero movie you've ever watched. Hmm. Um, so it goes like this. Um, you know, imagine, imagine uh, you know, some some uh, Batman movie. And it starts Avengers. out. I'm, I'm, I'm an Avengers fan. You're Avengers. Okay. Yeah, Avengers, right. whatever, Can we Avengers do Iron Man? Works. I like Iron Man. Iron Man works. All right. So you imagine an Iron Man movie. <laughs> what happens at the beginning of an Iron Man movie? Some some bad guy shows up and the world goes into is in chaos, right? There's a so, so something bad is happening and and it's uh it, it's disrupting you know the world and um and in, se in a sense the bad guy is a problem to be solved a new problem to be solved right yeah and and so you, the movie starts out with you know letting you wallow in like how bad things are and this bad guy's running rampant and you know and 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 
nothing can nothing can solve this nothing can stop this the police try whatever calling the army you know nothing works <laughs> um and uh and so then um the movie introduces the hero um which in this narrative is is the category essentially right this new category mm -hmm. but you introduce the hero um and and then the first thing you find out is what the what what that hero does what the hero is about like what the tools are that iron man has you start learning about that um and then you watch as um as you find out how the hero solves the problem of this bad guy and and then at the end of the movie everything is set right again and you see a, a, a picture of what the world now looks like now that things have been you know um put in place so it's that arc from um here's you know here, here's the bad guy Here's the dark side and every and and wallow in you know and how bad that is, which is the problem that's not being solved, um, whether it's for a business or whether for an individual or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and and after um, telling that story of how bad things are because of this bad guys out there, um, you introduce the the hero, this category, this thing, this new product or technology that's going to solve it tell people a little about how that technology is going to going to solve it because of what it does and and then you paint a picture of what things look like as that problem gets solved and the world gets put back into a better place and 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 actually at the only at the very end um, in the way that we structure these things all of that doesn't even mention the company it's just telling you the story of the problem and this the solution and then at the very end we'll 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 say and you know what um we this company um are the ones that are doing this and and we're going to solve this problem for you and we've already built it and you know rely on us and, you, and, and, you, and sign out that's, close, that's the story that's the plot close out the story with i am iron man Remember uh, that movie? Right. <laughs> wow that is textbook <laughs> that is textbook i love it. it it's a it's a simple uh uh, structure yet it's powerful because it really lines up all the uh, the major uh, uh, benchmarks of, of a story now uh does that happen uh the same way at an internal level with uh teams employees and staff and yeah so we 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 um we work with a company to create what and we call it a pov mm -hmm. point of view right so that's that's what that document is and and usually it's that that version of it so we we do it in conjunction with the leadership team. So, because the first thing is, everybody has to feel like they own it. Like they've all bought into it. You know, by the end of the the session, everybody says, "This is it, right? This is what this is our story." Um, and it's usually maybe a thousand words, eight hundred, a thousand words, which is a little long. But it's it's trying to you know really sort of tease out the story and mm -hmm. and and get in all the all the important little details. Um, and uh, and once that's locked down. Um, I mean, the first thing that a company would do is actually take that to the, inter, you know, to the employees internally and to suppliers and to contractors and partners and all that. And that that document should tell everybody that's involved with the company, this is exactly what we do and, and where we're heading and what that flag on the hill looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, and, and so that is the internal rollout. And then we don't, we never expect that that particular, that exact story is what you're going to present to the public um but it has to inform everything you present to the public because mm. uh, you know so if you're going to as you as you change the what your web page says or you create videos or television commercials or whatever you're going to do they all have to reflect that story and uh and right. start to manifest it in a bunch of different ways and uh and and also in you know investor decks um that's a big part of it. sales decks i mean all of those start to coordinate around what that story is telling and and, and then you start then it starts to move out in concentric circles out to you know different audiences that the company needs to reach yeah there's gonna be congruency uh you know within the message within the actions especially from from inside the team going outwards if you uh if you say okay we're all about um i don't know helping people out uh, you know get their first property or find their first home and whatnot and yet everything that's going out there is it's geared towards buying a car it's not going to make sense um right. yeah yeah no it's 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 huge and and yeah the um the uh the the power of storytelling is something that i i looked at um for the longest time i looked at it as something that was kind of like nice 
I'm like, all right, cool. Yeah, it'd be cool to have some branding, some, some, you know, some story uh, to everything that I'm doing. And I saw it as a, as a, um, like a nice to have, not, not, a ne- not a necessity for business, but it really is. I, every time I brought somebody into my team um, and I would do a hire, I mean, they, they would look at the pragmatic stuff they had to do. Okay. Uh, yeah. You got to you know, make these calls. You got to do this. You got to push that you know, button over there. You got to take this paperwork in, but there was no, no sense of purpose behind it. There was no buying at a, at a meaningful um, internal level for employees. Right. And I think that's what having a clear um, narrative of what your vision is uh, can do. I mean, it, it really, in my opinion, I think it solidifies the, uh, the team efforts. Well, absolutely. I mean, you're absolutely right. And, um, and, and you know, even for instance, um, we've had, you know, many companies uh, come back and say that how much it helped the product team. Um, and, you know, so you think about like traditional messaging um, that, uh, you know, that some firms do and messaging is really about, you know, taking what the company already does and putting some nice words behind it. If you really go through this category design uh, uh, process, it actually informs who you are as a company and what you're doing. And, and by doing that, um, that narrative story, if you put it in front of the product and engineering team, they now understand more clearly what product they're building and why they're building it. And, and rather than just, you know, maybe thinking, oh, you know, maybe I'll, you know, some customer requested maybe this feature, we'll just throw it on there. Um, you know, that, that, kind of, that kind of approach to product building, instead it becomes a much more focused exercise to solve that problem that you described in the story. Absolutely. And I, I think I can, um, I'm thinking of the, the example between Microsoft and Apple, right? Um, every time you go to uh, go buy a, a Windows computer, and I'm not, I'm not bashing on Windows users. I like Mac, but, uh, but uh, it's, every time I've looked at a, um, uh, for example, like an ad of uh, Windows and whatnot, they'll give you the RAM, they'll give you the, you know, the, the speeds and all the right. specifications, which I have absolutely no idea what that means, right? If I'm a consumer on my end, I'm concerned about real estate. Like, I don't know what you know, two point, whatever, you know, is going to do for me. Um, However, the, uh, the articulation that um, that Apple has is completely different. It's simplicity. Okay, cool. I want simple. Um, All that stuff is also noted somewhere in there, but it's not the highlight, right? So you have, you have the narrative, the power I'm seeing it right now, as you're, as you're, you know, telling me how it's broken down, you have the power of that narrative um, coming in, then pushing the message across as opposed to all the great stuff that might be awesome for somebody who understands it. Um, however, the vast majority of people are in living in their own world, right? They're, not everybody's going to understand uh, what that means. Not everybody's going to understand, for example, in real estate, in my, in, in my space, it, you know, what, um, you know, EMD and all kinds of, you know, all that stuff means. It, it, we have to simplify it somehow, some right. way. And I think um, having a structure like the one you just talked about is, is one of the, I mean, now I understand that it's one of the best um, activities that we can perform in any, in any type of business. So yeah, Kevin, thank you so much, man. I, I appreciate the, uh, the time, all the golden nuggets that you've dropped here. Um, can, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, maybe find out a little bit more um, as to, you know, how to work with uh, category design advisors or tap into, um, you know, you guys' resources, where would they find you? Well, uh, certainly the, the website, uh, category design advisors.com. Um, okay. And we'll have there. that on the show notes. Yeah. Yep, yep. And um, uh, there is, in fact, um, uh, we, we did a, um, in conjunction with uh, Techstars, did a uh, video series um, that explains some of category design and what's behind it. So you can find that on that website or on the Techstars mm-hmm. website. Um, okay. And um, uh, I, you know, and I, I have also, I mean, you go to kevinmaney.com if you want to see other books that I, I've, had, I've written a whole bunch of books and other topic areas in technology, too. Um, and, uh, uh, including That's one that, Kevin, Kevin Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, including one that came out last summer called on healthcare, which I wrote in conjunction with, uh, Hey Montanasia, who, um, is the managing director of general catalyst, one of the big VC firms, mm. um, and Steve Clasco, who is the CEO of Jefferson health in Philadelphia. And we wrote this book called on healthcare, which was about how AI, um, and a bunch of other technologies we're renting these days is changing um, healthcare. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That, that, well, that's a whole other um, uh, rabbit hole 
That's a whole uh, other rabbit. That's a big yeah, yeah. No, it's absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the future of healthcare, uh, especially post COVID, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, beautiful. Awesome. Um, I have this question that I like to ask everybody. We usually tap into, uh, you know, some of the mindset in terms of being an entrepreneur and, and going over the highs and the lows. Uh, you've seen, um, you know, through your through your history, you've seen, you know, the uh, how how the technological space has changed, right? Uh, especially being a journalist and being in it, being right in the middle of things as they happen, having conversations with, I mean, giants like Bezos and, and I mean, well, technically, you know, Bezos and I know you, so I can say that I know Bezos. Is that, is that how it works? <laughs> there you go. That's no? how yeah? it works. Yeah. Bezos is my friend. <laughs> by association. Yeah, by association, disclaimer. Uh, so, um, yeah, but it, it, it's amazing. So, it, it, you know, to, to see the trajectory that somebody uh, like you has. Um, now, in, in terms of, uh, of mindset, if you were to put one thing out there um, and, and, you know, for somebody who's, who's just, you know, maybe bottled up and, and in, in terms of progress in their business or there's a period of stagnation. I mean, you specialize really in kind of revamping and bringing life back into, into the story of a business, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and category. So, so what, would you, what would you say to that person? Um. Well, at the risk of being a little repetitive, first of all, is just stop thinking about um, pushing out what you do mm. and start thinking about why people need it. And, um, and if you can really perfect why somebody needs this, um, you can talk about what you do in a whole lot more effective way. Mm. And, um, and if you find yourself using language like um, we're faster, or, we've got this more buttons or, you know, or whatever else on our thing. Um, if you find yourself in that kind of language, um, you are probably- It's a huge uh, red flag. Trying to, trying to argue for scraping a little market share off of somebody else's back mm -hmm. rather than creating a whole new market for yourself. So think about that. If uh, you wanna talk about different, um, you wanna be talking about different, not better. That's probably a, a very simple way to say it. Wow, wow, that's that's beautiful and and <laughs> so powerful. It is. It's a total mind shift on on business development. Um, now, uh, more of a personal uh, question: If you were walking down the street and you ran into your seventeen-year-old self, <laughs> what would you tell that kid? <laughs> Um, you mean for, for public consumption, <laughs> <laughs> whatever, you know what we, in this podcast, we have no holdbacks because we cry. We we're happy. We're sad. It like, it doesn't matter. What would you tell the best piece of advice you would tell your 17 year old self? <laughs> Actually, I, I, I just, maybe this doesn't jive with your business program thing here, but I'll, I'll tell you, we start, you and I started out this, uh, I think before we got on here about talking about playing music and being in bands and all that stuff. Um, so I, um, I, you know, I, I, took music lessons, took instruments, whatever, when I was a young kid. And, um, and because I was a stupid teenager that wanted to do other things like, you know, chase girls and stuff like that and play <laughs> soccer, play soccer. Um, I, uh, I, I gave that up too early and stopped for a long, long time. It didn't come back to it until I was like 40 some years old. And if I could tell that kid wow. I, and, and the joy that I, you know, you know what this is like, right? The joy of doing that is um, is one of the one of the most fun things in my life. And if I could have go back and tell that kid something, I would have said, "Don't stop doing that. Build on it." Um, I would love to have been, you know, uh, much much farther along in my musical abilities and things like that than I that I am. I, you know, that that would probably be a good one. I would I would go there. Wow! No, that's I, I can totally relate, man. I, uh, I and you're the lead singer and rhythm guitar player in, in a band, right? In, in right in New York, right? Yeah, in New York. So the uh, I think the key word there is really joy. Um, it, it, there's uh, music has this this I have a special love love for music. It takes me away. I pick up the guitar and I start playing, even if nobody is around, you know, I get in my space and it just, it takes me away from the daily, you know, everything that we're doing. Right. Um, and so I, I completely, completely relate to it. Yeah. I dropped it for a while, picked it back up. And, and even, even though I'm not like, most people don't want to hear me, <laughs> I like, I enjoy it. So exactly. yeah, do, do one thing for you. Right. Exactly. That's what Beautiful. counts. Beautiful. Thank you so much, man. Well, it's been a blast. Uh, I think uh, I, the stuff that you talked about, it's really, it's really game changing. It's not, it's, um, 
things that we often forget to realize that are there, right? And, and just a simple pivot in a question, um, such as, you know, as opposed to what problem are you solving or what problem to uh, what problem do they don't know they have, uh, can bring a whole wave of new thought, a wave of new thoughts into into a business and and a creative thinking session, uh, especially when you link it up to uh, to uh, narratives and storytelling. So thank you so exactly. much, man. It's been a blast. There you guys have it. You got it here at the CEO Pulse Podcast, where you get the real, the raw, and the mind of entrepreneurship. Stay focused. You got this. Boom. <laughs>